like to welcome you all to the second day of the machine learning conference and we'll have a great first session. Uh, Sean, please take it away. Okay. And introduce so, the speakers and whatnot. Okay. Yeah, I just uh, I just briefly uh, introduced the team and I will I will start talk about the first paper. Uh, so um, so um, so uh, I'm I'm Sean. Uh, so uh, I know the, the name listed uh, on uh, at the presenter is Bao Zhong. Uh, he's my colleague at the Georgia State, uh, and uh, uh, he doesn't feel well today. So I'm going to present uh, the paper. And uh, I was uh, I was told maybe I need to help uh, chairing the session too. And uh, so we have a colleague uh, Wei Jiang uh, from Columbia University, and our uh, uh, PhD student uh, Alan. I don't know Alan is here, but normally when I, pre when I present this paper, I spend one minute to uh, talk about Alan. He was on the job market. This year was really tough. Uh, so I, I normally spend one whole minute to talk about how great he is uh, doing this project. But the good news is he has a job already, landing a good job. So I'm going to save that one minute for the paper. And, uh, uh, and uh, so, um, so basically this is a team and uh, let's move on to the, to the paper. And um, by the way, I, I just, um, and also appreciate uh, the conference committee accepted the paper and have us uh, to have the opportunity to, to present the paper. So uh, uh, I know I have uh, 20 minutes. Uh, so I was thinking about uh, what I can do uh, during the 20 minutes. So I'm going to focus on how we actually uh, come up with the idea. And uh, also uh, we talk about some anecdotal evidence we collected from industry. Uh, as I as I assuming a lot of things you guys can read the paper, but uh, I want to share with you guys the story behind the paper, and uh, so um, so maybe you guys can and then I leave out for Q and A so you guys can can raise questions. I also looking forward to discussing comments uh, for the paper. So this is uh, just like before I talk about what we are doing for the paper, I just want to uh, briefly talk about some of my personal experience. Uh, um, uh, if, if you, some of you read my, uh, my pipeline, I do a lot of machine learning. I was a computer science major for like seven years and I move on to finance and accounting. So I do a lot of uh, machine learning uh, research uh, with Bao Zhong uh, at the GSU FinTech group. And uh, this is the browser I normally see. So basically the lot of machine learning ad uh, kind of sent to me um, and uh, uh, on, on my browser. So I know I, I was watched. I was watched by machine. The machine actually tracking my browsing history, sending me these old ad. So uh, from my own experience, I has been wondering, what should I do as a person? What should I do if someone is watching, some, some machine is watching my life? So uh, uh, our paper just uh, attacked, just, uh, just take this angle in a different way. We are looking at the corporate setting. So, um, so what do we, uh, what do we actually, uh, uh, we read a, one uh, Wall Street Journal article. It shows that uh, a lot of uh, AI hedge funds, algorithm traders, they actually uh, use uh, um, advanced textual analysis tools to automatically download and the process uh, SEC findings and the, and the trade on the, on the, on the, on the firms. So, um, and the, the article also mentioned um, the, the, the executives, they, they need to go to like a training camp to learn how exactly they should talk to cater investors, not just human investors, also take cater to, to uh, uh, machine readers, those, uh, uh, those quant funds and, uh, and uh, AI traders. So, uh, so we got a, we, uh, the whole team got intrigued by this general article and we have a chance to talk to uh, many executives and the PR relation, uh, uh, PR officers. So we learned a lot, this is actually going on in the industry. Um, there's uh, it is, uh, 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 ongoing pressure from the machine readers uh, versus decades ago, we kind of just focus on how, how managers should disclose for human readers. But, but since there's a rising of the, um, of the human uh, machine readers. So the question here we want to ask is like earlier, my life experience telling me if my life is watched by machine, what should I do? Here is for corporate setting, if managers disclosure are, are watched by machines, what managers should do? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we're trying to talk to uh, 
we actually talked a lot of uh, um, uh, executives and firms to uh, kind of uh, generate generalize some uh, insights from them, and we want to formalize those insights, form formalize this anecdotal evidence as um, as a paper, and can can show the, um, the, the 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 emerging evidence from this uh, uh, AI era. So um, so um, I just want you. Uh, um, just before before I uh, talk about uh, uh, the techniques of this, uh, what do, what do we exactly do? Uh, so the big idea here is uh, is a straightforward. Basically, if the, the the firm's financial statements are read machine instead of human, what exactly should the manager manager what would manager do to cater to this machine uh, in addition to human? So this is the the general question we are asking uh, in the paper. And um, I want to give uh, like a uh, uh, where 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 does our paper stand in the literature? I think uh, uh, before I talk about all the details about machine learning, how we measure machine readership, and how we do the um, uh, at the at the at the uh, empirical level, I just want to spend like one or two minutes to mention how exactly our paper stands in the in the literature. So this is uh, like a very brief uh, slide summarize. Um, uh, what what has been done and the, what we are trying to do uh, for the literature. So most of uh, um, including including the paper I'm going to discuss uh, uh, I, I'm discussing through the paper in this session. So most of the paper actually what look at is uh, scholars using AI tools to provide AI tools for investors, for managers, for 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 regulators. So ha there has been like a, a long um, long. Uh, uh, history of uh, literature on these scholars trying to develop good AI tools for investors. And, uh, and uh, uh, th so this is, uh, um, this is where, where we, what do we have in the literature? So our paper are trying to approach this in a different angle. So what we are trying to tell, what we're trying to investigate in the paper is, what if investors are always, are already using AI tools? So given the existence of AI tools used by investors, what should manager respond? So we are not looking at how we help investors using AI tools. We are examining how managers should respond if investors using AI tools. So we, we kind of label this as a feedback effect. Um, you know, traditional uh, feedback effect is managers can learn feedback from stock price. So here, our definition is a little different. We are trying to examine how managers can learn from machine readers. So feedback from machine readers. So um, rather than feedback from the price. So uh, uh, that's how we're trying to position the paper and to, uh, to, um, to provide the first evidence on the feedback from machine readers. So um, I kind of developed uh, uh, one slide. I developed one slide. I want to use this one slide to explain ambitiously to explain all the measures we use in the paper, and uh, and also you guys know what we are trying to achieve and uh, any and also potential challenge we actually faced and how we conquer conquer them. So so I I I just want to put a, um, using one slide just like I said I want to ambitiously maybe just explain the whole big picture and the measure and the empirics of the paper so so we can move on the details um so uh, uh using the using the 20 minutes I'm watching my my time just make sure I'm not over so uh, um the first one the first one is uh how exactly we can proxy machine readership so the idea like I explained earlier we need to exactly to proxy uh, whether the disclosure is read by machine or read by human, so we need a proxy for that. So what do we use is what do we use is we use machine download of the disclosure as the proxy for machine readership. So um, so this is the uh, uh, machine readership measure. Some of, some of you may 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 already have question. If machine downloaded the finding, does that mean machine also read it? There's a there's a chance that machine downloads everything. But human read it, so that's very reasonable, uh, um, um, like a concern. And we did a, like a two additional validation to validate that machine download also uh, 
captures machine reading the findings. So where I explain momentarily, uh, I just put this aside. So, so another three important measure is how exactly the manager respond. So basically, basically if, if, if manager's disclosure findings is read by machine, how should the manager respond to machine readers? There are three measures here. Um, I'm going to explain, I'm going to spend like, a, this is important, I'm going to spend a couple minutes to uh, explain uh, um, uh, what we have. So the first one is machine readability. So uh, here is the example of machine readability. Maybe my screen is too small. Let me, let me uh, uh, full screen size. Okay, is it better? Okay, so look at this uh, paragraph. You can see this is a text. This is a, this is a text. This is a table. When human reads it, human can easily uh, like a, like a distinguish where is the table, where is the text. But the problem of this finding is uh, when machine has to read this tag, normally in the web script language, we, ha you are, we have to put like a table, table starting of the table or ending of the table. So we have to put the two tags to tell machine this is the table. So, so what the first magic we do is we actually uh, we get the uh, the we get the the uh, we kind of measure how friendly the the text can be passed by machine can be extracted by machine. So this measure would have less impact on human reading because when human reads it, it can they can easily tell which is text, which is table. But what we are not this measure do not focus on the content of the disclosure. This measure focus on the format focus on the web script language of the disclosure. So basically, if, um, if, the, uh, if the tag is missing, then machine will be difficult to read this, uh, uh, the, this is uh, uh, disclosure. This is just one of the example of our measure. We have like five components, a different way to measure how difficult for machine to pass it. I will explain later on, but this is just a simple example to show uh, how do we measure machine readability, which has less impact on human readability. The second one is content. So the first one doesn't have any content. So the second one is content. So basically what we do is we identify a list of keywords that is sensitive to machine, but less sensitive to human. So basically what we do is we, we want to get the, uh, we, we, we talk to industry, we talk to, uh, uh, we search along about the hedge fund white papers. We're trying to find out what actually they use fundamentally to pass, to, an to analyze the text. And then we identify the, the, the list of keywords that is used by uh, industry, but is less sensitive to human. And uh, what, we, what we want to say is, uh, managers may suppress the, the negative news that is sensitive to machine, but less sensitive to human. So this is what we want to uh, did in the second measure. This is about the content. The first one doesn't have a content. It's about the passing, how easy to pass. But second one, it does have the content. So basically, um, uh, uh, they, they suppress the negative news that is sensitive to the machine, less sensitive to human. The third one is the voice. So basically, um, the manager can change their voice, some of the voice nature too. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, we search on, uh, on the anecdotal evidence and the talk to some PR firms. So managers, uh, they have to, the most of managers, they go to some uh, training camp. Uh, there's a mentor uh, help them to talk and they can be more, they, they can look more friendly to the investors and they can, they can be more uh, friendly to machine based uh, uh, auto uh, software. So what do we do is we use a most popular machine based auto software to analyze their voice. And what we found is when the disclosure is downloaded more by machine, when, when, when the disclosure is read by machine and the managers we're trying to uh, cater, to, trying to cater to the machine-based uh, uh, auto software, and um, so basically, managers want to look good to to machine-based uh, auto uh, uh, software to 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 make a, to make everyone happy. So these are the three disclosure measures um, we use to to um, to to kind of provide evidence how exactly managers 
uh, when they see their disclosure are read by machine, um, uh, they would do to respond to the machine machine readers. And the following is the two validation test, going back to the question I raised earlier. So basically um, the machine download, how is the machine download really is, is proxy machine reader, not just download only. We have a two validation. The first one is if machine download the disclosure and also, and also uh, analyze the disclosure, we should see that the trading is faster than human read the uh, document. Uh, there's no doubt machine can uh, uh, and um, understanding the, the, the files uh, quicker than human. So we use the trading speed to validate the download is actually correlated with machine reading the, the findings. Another thing is we use the AI hedge funds ownership. So we go to the LinkedIn, we get all the AI hedge funds uh, uh, background. We, uh, we identify uh, AI hedge funds, quant hedge funds. The hedge funds, they are more likely to use um, uh, machine learning to trade the, to select the stocks. We found that the machine download is also correlated with um, the AI hedge fund. So basically, uh, the, the download is driven by AI hedge funds. So uh, give us the confidence that uh, uh, it's, it's not just, um, um, it's not just, uh, um, it's not just a uh, uh, machine uh, download, it's also machine reading. I know I only have like two minutes left, but uh, I want to uh, one, uh, speak one more thing. What we have here is sometimes uh, we were thinking ourselves, can managers really change their voice? Like, like, like I, I may talk very excited here. Do I always, always talk excited? Uh, so what do we do here is we, we kind of, we have, we divide the talk into two, two parts. One is spontaneous talk. Another one is the uh, script talk. We find that the, the voice is uh, the, the manipulation of the voice or, or voice management concentrate on the script talk. Um, and we find the less evidence on the spontaneous talk. So kind of uh, we're trying to uh, um, uh, expect the challenges and we want to f find out a solution to validate our findings. So, um, so I'm going to uh, just go very quickly to the following slides and um, to summarize what we have. So this is the trend of the machine download. Like, like, like I said earlier, in earlier uh, decade in 2003, there's no much machine download machine readership. There's a rising trend significantly. Now it's like 80%, 90% uh, SEC findings are read by machines. And uh, uh, I covered most of the contents here. Um, so I don't want to over time to uh, uh, occupy the discussions uh, uh, presentation. And uh, so uh, I just want to uh, um, do some summarize uh, using the, uh, so how, how do we know uh, the industry is actually using uh, the, the keywords we are, we are claiming to. So we basically find the, the hedge fund white paper and we talk to uh, some industry people to make sure actually the, the industry is are using these, um, uh, the, the keywords that is sensitive to machine. And we minus the human keywords. So the difference between the keyword list is the keyword list I was talking about um, uh, sensitive to machine and less sensitive to human. I think uh, my time is up. I'm looking forward to my discussion uh, presentation, and uh, and I will come back uh, come back again to discuss the third paper. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, can Sean. you can you please uh, unshare your screen so that I can? Yes, I did. Did I? Yeah, I think so. Let me okay. See. So can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, so yes. let me start by saying that thank you for to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to discuss this uh, fantastic paper. I, I learned a lot uh, from reading this paper and I even learned more and understood more after Sean's presentation. Uh, the reason uh, Bao Zhong's Yang's name is uh, bolded because I thought he is the one who is going to present. Uh, my name is Arup Ganguly. I'm from University of Mississippi. Okay, so what's the main research question? Uh, so do publicly listed firms change the way they talk with the advent of the natural language processing algorithms in voice and text? And if yes, then how do these firms strategically acclimatize their disclosure knowing that machines are listening and reading? So the setting is a sample of 10 Ks, 10 Qs, 
Uh, they also have conference call audios. So time period of conference call audios is 2010 to 2016. The reason I have color coded it because that's the part I like the most. Uh, it's difference in differences using the publication of Logger and McDonald JF 2011 as a quasi natural event. And the main findings as Sean very nicely uh, described is like machine readership listening incentivizes listed firms to disclose in a way that is friendlier to machine parsing and processing. So the management actually adjusts their tone and sentiment to cater to the machine uh, processing. So overall evaluation, I love the paper. It's a timely research question. Uh, they have used an innovative approach of machine readability. And I commend the authors for data collection. Uh, they have over 90,000 10Ks, uh, over uh, 269,000 10Qs, and they also have conference call audios of more than 43,000. Uh, it's one of the first studies, at least in finance, to explore uh, how firms strategically respond to machines reading and listening disclosures. Nicely written, I enjoy reading it. Following are some suggestions, and hopefully authors might find some of it useful. So my comment one is on the key variable used by the authors, which is machine readability. So if you look at this chart, and this is from MIT Tech Review, uh, the NLP models have evolved over time. So they use something called the bag of words approach, which was initiated, which started in 1950s. And now we have things like Elmo, Bird. These are more machine learning algorithms. And also at the same time, the computing power has evolved as well. And there has been a drastic jump in computing power in the last 10 or so years, which is usually, which is typically the time of, uh, for, for this paper. So NLP algorithms are in computing power constantly evolving. Key variable is machine readability. So that is the ease at which a filing can be processed. But isn't that constantly changing with more computing power and better algos? I remember, I do a lot of textual analysis and I remember like just a couple of years ago, it, is, it was very difficult to scrape uh, like PDF scanned files, but now you can off, have off the shelf uh, OCR uh, readers that can do it for you. And so there's a huge resource gap between academics and industry. As much as I, as we would like to think that, okay, we are not able to scrape it, most likely a billion dollar corn hedge fund is not able to scrape it either. So we have to be a little bit careful about that. So machine readability is a dynamic concept. My second comment is about figure two uh, of the paper and the authors are showing a trend in machine readability. And if you look at the, look at the graph carefully, so the x-axis is uh, the timeline and the y-axis is the readability of machine readability. Almost all the increase in machine readability is coming prior to 2007. And 2007 to 2015, it seems to be nearly flat and also there is a sudden drop after 2013. So I, I wasn't able to figure out why that's happening. And probably it goes back to my first comment that machine readability is constantly changing. And if you believe that Logger and McDonald's JF paper in 2011, 10 years ago was an instrumental event in a different dev setup, then shouldn't we observe a significant improvement in readability post 2011? And that we don't, that the authors don't observe. So machine readability is different from human readability. Humans read probably the same way what they used to do 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Yes, the words have changed, uh, but machine readability constantly changes. My next comment is on their another important key variable, which is machine downloads. And Sean did a fantastic job of saying uh, what, what it means, explaining what it means. But machine downloads is used as a proxy for the presence of machine readers. So if a web crawler has been used by an IP address downloading more than 50 unique firms, filings on a date is assumed to be a machine reader. So I agree that machine downloads are a necessary requirement of machine readability. However, it is an insufficient condition. There can be many reasons why someone would web crawl and download 10Ks and 10Qs, and that necessarily does not mean that filings will be ingested by an algo. Think of not just uh, academics or researchers, you can think of analysts who are covering a, a certain sector. And if I have to download 40 companies, why would I go and download one by one on Edgar? I would download all of them, but that doesn't mean I would, wouldn't be reading them uh, physically. So you have to be a little bit uh, careful uh, when, you, when you say that. My next comment is on, it's not very specific to this paper, but in general as well, the bag of words approach. So, the paper uses two word lists. So first one is the Harvard Psychosociological Dictionary and the second one is Logger and McDonald's Specialized Finance Dictionary. I'm a big fan of uh, 
Logan and McDonald's specialized finance stationery because I think the specialized stationeries do a much better job. But that said, these kind of bag overs approach research is highly dependent on researchers' subjectivity. So if you simply compare the negative words to in both these stationeries, you will have significant differences. Also, the bag of word approach does a poor job of making sense of the context of meaning. So there are hundreds of such journal and domain specific word lists. So my recommendation would be to use an ML algorithm. So you can use the most latest one like Elmo, Bird, but you might argue that, okay, they seem like if they are off the shelf you're using, they seem like a black box. I would say, instead of using Log and McDonald, if you also use the pair of words like biograms, that will have a much better predictability and you might get better results. Uh, my next comment is on figure three of the paper. And here the idea is to show that there is, they are testing the parallel trends of LM and Harvard sentiments. And the way the authors have done is they, it is LM minus Harvard negative sentiments. So I wasn't sure like what this difference is capturing because LM words, there are many common words uh, in negative word list of LM and Harvard. And there are also many different words. So I think that the easier way to do that would be to see, like do this test, this parallel pre-trend separately, and it can be simpler to interpret. And I do agree with the authors though, that Logan and McDonald's paper was published in 2011 and it's a quasi random. So as researchers, we don't know when our papers will eventually be published, but it will be more interesting to see what words do companies tend to avoid after 2011. So what exactly are the words and to provide some context to the bag of words approach. My next comment is on uh, this regulatory shock of SEC's XBRL mandate in 2011, which coincides with LM publication. So as much as I would like to think that we as financial economists have an impact on the industry, and I really like LM, uh, LM word list, but if there's a regulatory shock at the same time, I would, I would think that there is more impact of the regulatory shock as compared to the LM uh, publication. So are the results observed driven mainly by ACC's XVRL mandate? So the XVR adoption by a firm is determined primarily by the firm's market flow. And if you are above or below the flow at a certain cutoff, I don't remember what, what it is exactly, but it renders you to a very nice RDD setup, which I think is more believable in terms of causal inference. So you might want to try that uh, as well and see uh, whether uh, your results, it will help your uh, paper hugely. My next comment is on the conference call audience. This is the, my favorite part of the paper. This is the paper, the part I like the most. So the authors explore a sample of 43,462 conference call audios between 2010, 2016. So the way the management talks during conference call can definitely help to capture the feedback effect. So uh, two suggestions here, make the audio tones analysis the primary part of the paper. So when I was reading the paper, this part is actually coming right before the conclusion. It's too late in the game. And this I think is the, the most intriguing part of your paper. Also, you may want to focus on different parts of the conference calls. And sometimes as you, as Sean mentioned that the, these managers are trained how to speak by investor relations or consultants. So you might want to focus on different parts of conference calls that prepare statements versus impromptu responses when you are doing this analysis. So I will conclude by saying important research question with a potential to publish in a top journal, highly recommended for reading. Good luck with future versions. I will email the authors my discussion slides. Thank you very much. Do we respond or we just go back next? Well, oh, we're right about on time but if you want to talk for maybe a minute or so that shouldn't put us okay. too far okay i just want to appreciate uh, rob's uh, discussion very thorough very careful and uh and uh, uh well, i have noted uh, uh most of them and uh, uh just two quick comments uh, since i only have one minute the first one is uh uh, uh what do we have the paper uh, uh we can make the writing more clear we are not saying we are using a bag of water approach to analyze text we are not saying the industry is using a bag of word approach to analyze the text. What we are saying is the LM dictionary, it's uh, one of the foundation, one of the input for them to develop advanced 
uh, algorithm. So they maybe use a uh, new network, LSTM. Maybe we maybe use uh, um, uh, different uh, machine learning tools, but the 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 the, the pre-process they may use the LM dictionary when you uh, are when you are uh, when they develop the technology. So that's the part we are claiming. We're not saying they are using backwards approach. So I want you to clarify that. Uh, we will clarify it in the writing. I think it's a great point. The second one is we see the flat of the readability. That's exactly the point you raised in the 2000. There's the adoption of XBRL. Uh, because of that, the readability become flat. That's um, and we also make that clear in the paper as well. And the last one is that before the 2011, what we based on the anecdotal evidence we we, we have uh, collected is there's no standard dictionary in the industry. So each each investment companies they have their own way to have their keywords. They they there's no consensus on the on the on the keywords they use to analyze the financial uh, statements. Uh, after 2011. There's more consensus on the LM dictionary. That's that's the uh, shock we are introducing. Uh, so, was, uh, thank you for your comments. We I think uh, they are great uh, uh, for us to clarify the writing. We we will, we will do so. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. So my my the big suggestion there was that you can. I'm pretty skeptical to believe that these quantitative hedge funds are using LM words, even though you show some evidence, and I'm from there because it's very easy to spit out words using machine learning algorithms. And there was a paper presented in this conference yesterday. They did a horse race and, and Paul can correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. And yeah. just by doing a bigram, they were, they were beating in prediction the LM words. So yeah. I'm pretty sure the hedge funds know that already. And they have been. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. We're not saying that, we're not saying they are completely relying on LM words. LM words is just a small portion of their algorithm. Yeah, that's what we captured, yeah. Let me see. Oh, so it's my turn. So I have to share my screen again. Okay. Yeah. Is it my turn or I am assuming it's my turn? Uh, well, I so have... yeah, Sean is uh, in charge of the session, but yeah, the, I think yours is the second paper. Yes, Arab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's your turn, I think. Yeah, please go ahead. Can you guys see my slides again? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this terrific uh, machine learning conference uh, for selecting our paper in the program and Mehran for agreeing to discuss the paper. The title of our paper is The Impact of Tightly Contested Governance Proposals on Firms, Narrative Disclosures, Evidence from Regression, Discontinued Design. It is joint work with Abhi from University of Oklahoma, Lynn, who is my colleague at OMS, and Chad from University of Pittsburgh. And as the title suggests, in this paper, we exploit locally exogenous variations in corporate governance created by close call governance related shareholder proposals using a fuzzy RDD and text analytics to examine whether better corporate governance causally impacts the narratives in the corporate dis disclosures. So here's a motivating anecdote. So you may remember that sometime in August 2018, there was a tweet from Elon Musk on taking Tesla private. SEC gets involved due to most drastic departure from standard disclosure practices, as you would expect. And eventually the conflict ends in an enforcement action and settlement. So other than the $20 million fine, two of the most important end results of the settlement included that first, Musk must step down as the chairman of the board and be replaced by an independent chairman. So it's a corporate governance change. And second, Tesla must add two independent directors and create a formal disclosure committee to oversee Musk com communications. Another corporate governance change. So what is the underlying presumption of a regulator like SEC? It is better corporate governance will lead to better disclosure practices. However, when we started looking at some of the literature's well-cited reviews, it does not seem to be that obvious. For instance, Brown and his co-authors write in 2011, and I quote, despite the presumption from the regulators that corporate governance leads to better disclosure practices, studies find opposing results, leaving the debate open as to whether corporate governance is a substitute for or complementary to a firm's uh, disclosure practices. In a more recent survey, uh, Lewis and Wisowski write, and I quote, this incentive of the governance role of disclosure regulation deserves greater attention, a point that we emphasize in this review. So what is the theoretical motivation? So there's vast uh, theoretical literature in both corporate governance and disclosure, and in no way I'm attempting to summarize them on this one slide. However, one useful way 
to organize the models relating to corporate governance and disclosures to put them into these two broad categories. First are the models that explore the monitoring role of corporate governance. For instance, in the presence of incomplete and costly contracts, corporate governance can play a monitoring role in the principal agent framework, resulting in better disclosure practices. Now, under this line of thinking, disclosures can be modeled as an increasing function of corporate governance. And the prediction here would be a positive association between corporate governance and better disclosure. Now, the second set of models are based on information asymmetry and emphasizes the substitution effect of corporate governance. Here, the idea is that since both corporate governance mechanism and transfer disclosures are not costless, both governance and disclosure are determined jointly in equilibrium. So under these class of models, disclosure can be written as a decreasing function of corporate governance. And the prediction here would be a negative association between corporate governance and better disclosure. Now, when we look at the empirical evidence on the relationship between corporate governance and disclosure, that's also mixed and not just in the US, but in other parts of the world as well. So we think that there are two different plausible reasons for such mixed findings in, in the literature. The first one is, or the most likely reason is that both corporate governance and firm disclosure are endogenously determined. Think of the different specific sources of endogeneity, like reverse causality, measurement error, omitted variable bias. Now, there are two papers in particular, Boone and White and Bird and Crowley. They attempt to address this identification challenge using Russell index reassignments as an exogenous source of variation to the firm's ownership structures and arguably, arguably for governance. But unfortunately, there is little agreement on the literature on how Russell reconstitutions impact firms' ownership structures. The second reason is the vast majority of academic studies examining uh, the relationship between corporate governance and disclosure do not consider soft disclosure and SEC filing narratives. Even though most of the pages in the filings are devoted to text, and some papers that do incorporate soft disclosure focus primarily of the, on the quantity of disclosure. However, we know that more disclosure does not necessarily mean better disclosure, an important dimension that we highlight in this paper. And as the first paper in this session has shown us, narratives are an essential dimension of disclosures, not only for humans, but now increasingly for machine and AI readers. So what is our identification strategy? So to address uh, endogeneity and to establish causality, we rely on a regression discontinuity design where locally exogenous variation corporate governance is created by close call corporate governance related shareholder proposal boards. It is a fuzzy RDD because the passing of the shareholder proposal only increases the probability of the treatment, that is the proposal's actual implementation, even though they are non-binding. However, the extended literature documents that the probability of implementation at the majority threshold can be inferred to be around more than 20%. And that implementation, implementation rate jumped to approximately 70% post 2003, found by a recent paper uh, back in Metzger in RFS 2019. We are not the first ones to employ this empirical strategy in setting one of the first papers in corporate finance using this strategy. And the same setting is QNET et al, JF 2012. So we closely follow the methodology. There have been several other published papers in finance since then to do so as well. The basic econometric idea here is that since either the firm or the dissident cannot precisely manipulate voting on such close call governance proposals, it's locally random. So here the slide provides you two examples of such close call governance proposals included in our study. So in the first example, you can see that the governance proposal narrowly failed as they only received 49.4% votes in favor. And the second example, the governance proposal narrowly passed as they received a little over 50% votes in favor. Now note that such close call proposals before the vote, given the uncertainty inherent in the voting outcome, the market participants cannot predict which close call proposal will pass and which will fail. However, after the vote, the uncertainty is resolved since some proposals pass and others do not. And the disclosure for each firm reacts correspondingly uh, to incorporate this governance shock. So the next slide shows the summary statistics. Uh, this slide provides uh, the statistics for governance proposals included in the study. Governance data and the data on shareholder proposals are from risk metrics and shock ripple in the sample period is 1997. We read each proposal with the requirement of a 50% threshold for approval and a valid voting result and use only governance related proposals. We also manually classify the governance related proposals by proposal type after reading the proposals and we just follow the methodology by QNET. Textual variables have been created from 10 case downloaded from SEC's Edgar. Other data sources are not just standard. So our empirical methodology relies on the assumption that either the firm or the dissident cannot, cannot precisely manipulate the votings on such governance proposals. 
So to test our assumption in the figure shown on this slide, we have plotted the density of governance related proposals in our sample in a histogram with the x-axis of the figure depicting the percentages of votes cast for the proposal. The figure shows that there's no systematic sorting of firms within the proximity of 50% vote threshold, indicating graphically that there is no evidence of precise manipulation at the cutoff of 50% by either voters or managers. We also conduct more formal tests as recommended by Justin McCurry's 2008 paper and more recently by Catania Jansen in May 2019 and find no evidence of precise vote manipulation. So here's our empirical design. On the left-hand side, we have the primary dependent variables that are textual proxies for quantity and or similarity of disclosure in the narratives of 10 Ks. On the right-hand side is the primary variable of interest is the dummy pass, which equals one if the close call governance proposal passes and zero otherwise. We also included Z, which is a vector of more than dozen controls, even though fuzzy RD design does not record the inclusion of controls other than the forcing variable to obtain consistent estimates. We include year and industry fixed effects. We cannot include firm fixed effects since we have very few firms in our sample where the same firm had both a pass and a fail close call governance related proposal. That said, we include firm fixed effects when we conduct all this panel regressions and RDD for all proposals, not just close call proposals. Let me talk a little bit about the textual disclosure variables we use. So for textual disclosure variables, we focus not only on the quantity, that is word count, complex word count, sentence count, but also on disclosure similarity. This is because more quantity does not necessarily mean that it is better disclosure. It could be merely copy paste boilerplate language. So we closely follow Lauren Cohen's and his co-authors J.F. paper recently published last summer to create such similarity measures, cosine similarity, jacquard similarity, modified jacquard, minimum measure distance, and Cohen and his co-authors find that the subtle changes in similarity in 10K filings are associated with fundamental changes in performance at these firms. So without going into too much of detail of the math and the mechanics of these similarity measures as the audience in this conference is already well versed in it, let me try to give you an intuition of what these measures pick up by describing just one of them. And let's talk about minimum edit distance, which can be thought of as the minimum number of operations it takes to edit document D1 into document D2. Operations like insertions, deletions, substitutions that you would do with using any editing platform. However, note that the scores of minimum edit distance can be greater than one or 100% and the similarity reduces with higher scores, which is opposite to the other three measures. Okay, now let me show you our main results. To address endogenous issues, we implement a fuzzy RDD as I described below as our identification strategy, where we use the passing of the shoulder proposal as a shock to the corporate governance so using this close call proposal enables us to create locally exogenous shocks to governance to establish a causal impact of governance on firms and related disclosures. So here's the main idea in this table is that better corporate governance causally increases the quantity and complexity. However, if you notice in panel B, it also increases the similarity of text and disclosures, makes them more repetitive and boilerplate. Here we have used a bandwidth of 10%. Now, in this, on this slide, we are using a, a narrow bandwidth of 5% to reduce noise and bias even further. And this is an interesting result. The results are not significant for the quantity of disclosure anymore. However, the results in terms of document similarity are stronger, both in terms of magnitude and significance as indicated in the panel B of the table. If I may bring your attention to model seven, where the dependent variable is the jacquard similarity measure, the coefficient on independent variable of interest that is passed is 0 0.043, significant at the 1% level. So this indicates that the passing of a governance related proposal within a narrow bandwidth of 5% actually translates into a predicted increase of 10K similarity of 0 0.043, which is an increase of approximately 0.5 standard deviation jacquard similarity. So I, I think I already mentioned that Cohen et al. document that just subtle changes in the similarity in the 10K filings is associated with fundamental change in the performance of these firms. So half a standard deviation change in similarity is economically significant. Okay, so we have done a lot of additional tests and instead of going through each one of them for the benefit of time, I will just quickly highlight some of the things. Okay, so to ensure that our results are robust and are not driven by coincidental discontinuity and unobservables, we have conducted many different tests, which are a significant part of the paper. And the first one is distracted shareholders. We know from the prior literature that distracted shareholders are less likely to be have a disciplinary effect. 
Therefore, we conjecture that if the results shown are really causal, then RDD results should be stronger when institutional investors are not distracted. So the idea here is that distracted shareholders would weaken if not nullify the causal impact of passing the shareholder governance proposals due to the weaker oversight. And we find consistent results. We have used CHEMS, uh, RFS papers, exogenous institutional distraction measure. The second thing we do is we look at media coverage. The extent literature has shown that media coverage can also play an effective governance role. For instance, Alexander Dyke and co-authors find that international media coverage of Russian firms increases the likelihood of reversals of corporate governance valuations. So we here we conjecture that if the passing of the governance related proposals indeed impacts narratives of disclosures in 10 case, then such an effect should be more pronounced when there is greater media coverage. And we find great consistent results. Third, we extend our sample beyond close call proposals just to make sure that our results are uh, not merely limited to the close call proposal and have some external validity. Uh, so moreover, we, to make sure that we are not mistaking non-linearity for discontinuity, discontinuity, we also incorporate different polynomial terms of our proposals on both the left and the right sides of the thresholds uh, to allow for different functional forms. We also do a principal component analysis. We conduct placebo tests, but we artificially assume voting thresholds for approval are as 25% and 70% instead of 50%. Uh, as the approval of governance related shareholder proposals in the sample. Uh, and we test robustness of our uh, results post 2003, say, this RFS paper by Back and Misger. Uh, they point out that before 2003, management really implemented shareholder proposals, which could potentially render the RDD threshold as a weak instrument. And so we do that. And finally, we expect, uh, as expected, our results are more pronounced for G index related governance proposals as they have been found to be have to have a largest impact on, on firm value in trial literature. Okay, so here are my concluding remarks. Uh, we study the causal impact of corporate governance on firms disclosures in the narratives of 10 case using fuzzy RED and demonstrate that better corporate governance in firms results in more complex boilerplate and plausibly less informative disclosures and narratives subsequent in the subsequent 10 case. Results are also robust to a battery of tests, including investor distraction and media coverage. Such results provide empirical support to the theoretical models of disclosure that treat corporate governance and disclosure as substitutes rather than complements, and call into question the common perception amongst regulators that better corporate governance leads to more informative disclosures. Thank you, and I look forward to your comments and suggestions. Okay, Maron. I... Uh, I'll wrap left uh, one minute for you. So you have 11 minutes now. Enjoy. Yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, that was a great presentation. Can you guys see my slides? Perfect. Uh, my name is Mehran. I'm discussing uh, the paper that was just presented. Uh, let me move to my slideshow. All right. Okay, let me just briefly overview uh, the paper. Um, uh, I'll make it short, but uh, I just need to uh, explain the way I see the paper and I'll come back to these uh, points. So the paper tries to establish um, causal effect of corporate governance on disclosures narratives. And the paper starts by saying that there's this open question in the literature, meaning that there are studies on governance is a substitute for or complementary to firm's disclosure practices. Does better corporate governance uh, increase firm disclosure practices or decrease it? And we have studies with um, results on both sides of the argument. Uh, so it's a, there's a gap in the literature that needs to be addressed. However, there is a challenge and the challenge is that each of these two corporate governance and uh, disclosure practices are endogenously determined as well as the relationship between the two. So it's not a, uh, an easy question to answer and to settle uh, this debate. However, the authors find this nice solution uh, by looking at exogenous, possibly exogenous variation in corporate governance. Uh, so basically what they do is that they look at the pass or fail of governance enhancing shareholder proposals by a around a threshold of 50 percent and this is an uh, already designed and we also know that these proposals are non-binding 
and they only they only increase the chance of uh, being implemented in the future and as a result we have fuzzy uh, regression discontinuity design all right so a brief overview of the results of the paper uh, so the paper finds a positive relation between corporate governance and the quantity of and it also finds a positive relation between uh, corporate governance and the complexity and the boilerplate nature of uh, the disclosures. Uh, the paper also performs a series of robustness tests, including partitioning sample based on extracted shareholders, the amount of media coverage. They also look at different bandwidths around the 50% threshold. Uh, they use alternative RDDS specifications, they perform a placebo test, they look at the post-2003 uh, period and a couple of more robustness tests to uh, further support the evidence on the causal effect of corporate governance on disclosure practices. All right, so overall, I think this is a very interesting paper and it tries to uh, fill this gap that exists in the literature. And I think the idea has a lot of potentials. So I'm hoping that my comments are helping the paper. Uh, the paper is also well written, uh, but I have a few uh, comments and suggestions regarding the motivation, the empirical designs, and I have a few minor comments as well. All right, so let me start by this open question uh, that exists in the literature. Uh, as the, as the uh, presenter uh, just talked about, uh, these Boone and White and Bird and Curley 2015 and 2016, they do establish uh, positive um, causal effect of corporate governance on firm disclosures. But uh, the paper argues that um, uh, the use of Russell index reconstitution as an exogenous shock to institutional ownership is controversial, which is true. We know that. And I think right away what comes to my mind is that, all right, so we argue that uh, the their source of exogenous variation is not valid. Then when we think that we have a better design, better empirical design, then we can right away try to answer the same question that these two papers are trying to answer, but with the use of our own source of exogenous variable, I, th I, th change. I think this is a big missed opportunity that the paper doesn't look into. The paper focuses on the change in the changes in the language that is used in 10K disclosures, uh, but I think it does not necessarily settle the debate, right? If we, if we, the question that we're trying to answer is whether corporate governance is a substitute or a complementary to corporate disclosures, then we need to look at all aspects of disclosures, not just the narrative, but also other variables that are related to the quality of disclosures, right? Uh, so even though if we um, agree with all the results of the paper, I think the, 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 the debate is still not settled. And I think there is a potential that all the, the authors can add this uh, this part of uh, this this analysis to to their paper to basically settle this debate. So my suggestion is that uh, uh, they can investigate a broader set of variables that are related to firm disclosures, including the ones that are used in um, Bird and Curley 2016 paper. That should uh, make it clear if there is a there's a still uh, contradicting results with the with the existing literature or not. So my second comment relates again to the motivation of the paper. So here's the uh, quote from the chairwoman of the SEC that the paper starts with. Uh, so basically uh, she says that we want to hold managers accountable, but accountability is impossible without transparency. And as, as a result, we want to implement these rules so that we will improve the disclosure around risk, compensation, and corporate governance. So, and we can increase um, investors' um, utility, right? And there's another quote from the paper uh, that talks about the conflicting results in the literature and then says, uh, most regulators tend to believe that better governance would automatically lead to a higher quality of firm disclosures. 
So where I'm getting with this is that what aspects of disclosures seem to matter to us? So it turns out that it's transparency, how it's related to disclosures around topics such as risk and compensation, and uh, what exactly is the higher quality of disclosure? So here's another, another quote from the paper. Uh, it says, it's an open question whether better corporate governance indubitably leads to more informative disclosures, which is the primary research question of this study. I would say uh, this is another aspect of disclosures that seems to matter, how informative disclosures are. So what disclosure qualities actually do matter based on these quotes from EC um, chairperson and other quotes from the paper and the literature, it seems like transparency matters, informativeness matters, the relevant to risk compensation and corporate governance are the qualities that we care about when we talk about disclosures. But does the paper actually measure these qualities? Right? We want to answer those questions whether corporate governance affects uh, disclosures, then are we actually measuring any of these quali qualities uh, with the measures that are used in the paper? What the paper measures is that first of disclosures, number of words, number of sentences, number of paragraphs. And then second, it measures the similarity from year to year of a firm's disclosures over time. But um, are they really measuring the quality of disclosures? I would say not. And you might say that um, higher quantity might be related to informativeness, but then the problem arises because similarity uh, can offset the effect of quantity, right? If if a report is more similar to the previous year, then it may not be as informative. And the, the problem is that, so these two are related to each other. As the paper finds, uh, higher corporate governance results in higher quantity and higher similarity. So when both of them increase, there's that can be said about the quality of the disclosure. We can't even say if it's now either it's more informative or less informative. It doesn't seem that we are uh, we we are able to uh, measure lots of things. All right. So there's another thing that paper does. Paper also tries to measure complexity. And even though it says we do not use any word list that proxy for sentiments or readability, so this is the way they try to measure complexity. Complexity. So they measure word. Uh, Word uh, number of words that contain three or more syllabus. This is very close to the way we uh, construct the FOG index. FOG index has two components. The second component of it that's highly criticized is the one that uses word syllabus to measure complexity. Uh, so all in all, it doesn't seem like these are uh, good measures of disclosure quality. So my suggestion is that so in terms of informativeness, we can look at the market formation for our treatment and control group. They can measure bog readability index, which is introduced by Bonsell et al. And they can look at specific sections of 10K, such as risk factors, and they measure soft information, such as sentiment, or try to measure the number of boilerplate sentences, uh, which again, in this quote by the paper, are sentences that does not change from quarter to quarter. So even small changes in some of these disclosures may not be boilerplate because if you change the adjective of a, the, the way that you're describing a river, uh, that can change things that really can add um, information. Uh, I guess I'm out of time. Give me one more minute. I have a few other concerns about the empirical design. Uh, so I think if, uh, if we see uh, analysis on parallel trends before uh, these, um, proxies that I uh, can add to the richness of the empirical design. And I also have this concern, is the outcome of close call votes really, as the paper mentions that there are few firms with um, the outcome that are both fail and pass, that raises the question, is this really randomness in the result of these outcomes or not? And I have the question on the baseline specification. In this equation, uh, the paper says n is equal to one or two or three. Uh, but again, this is, it doesn't seem like we see all, all the results with n equal to two, one, two, or three. And if 
n is equal to all three of these, I think this uh, overestimates our uh, statistical significance. I have a few minor comments as well. Uh, I'll share my slides with the authors. Uh, sorry, I took one uh, more minute than I was supposed to. But good luck with the paper. It was very interesting. I think there is room to uh, improve the quality of it, and I'm looking forward to the next version of the paper. Thank you so much. Mehran, I think this is your turn to present. <laughs> you can continue. Yeah. Thank you, Mehran. Yeah. I just wanted to quickly just one one sentence. Thank you very much. Sure. All your comments are pretty well taken, and you read the paper very seriously. Just one minor comment I will make is our paper is not showing that it increases both similarity and the quantity. So when I showed you the five person bandwidth, I showed you that the only result that stays when we reduce the bias is the similarity. So that's different from Bird and Crowley other than their setup. And also uh, Bird and Crowley don't look at similarity, which is becoming more and more important in terms of, other than that, uh, we can talk offline. Thank you again for great comments. Sure, absolutely. All right, it's my turn presenting my own paper. Um, all right, let me, you can see my slides, right? Okay, yes. awesome. Let me introduce myself in case um, some people just joined this session. My name is Mehran. I'm presenting this paper that's a joint work with uh, my advisor, Anoop Agrawal. We are at the University of Alabama, though I'm changing institution later this year. Um, so, okay, so the, paper is about positive sentiment in corporate reports. So we know that there's this big and growing literature on the use of textual data in economics and finance. More specifically, sentiment or tone is widely analyzed in financial text. However, we know that the extent methods have low accuracy, which results in low power and incorrect inferences. And the problem is more pronounced when it comes to measuring positive sentiment. So it's quite challenging, and I'll get to this point later on. Uh, and as a result of this challenge, literature is inconclusive regarding the information content of positive sentiment. Right? And um, we, we, we know that negative sentiment is informative. Uh, the inconclusiveness is only related to the positive sentiment. Uh, so here's an example from, uh, this sentence is from a 10K. Right? The, this sentence talks about competition the tone of the sentence is negative. It says that competitors have, have um, access to more resources. They achieve greater acceptance in the marketplace, et cetera, et cetera. The red are positive words, but the context is negative, right? So this simple example gives you um, what we are doing uh, when measuring sentiment in the paper. So the most common way to measure sentiment is by looking at words. And as you can see in this example, words matter in the context. And there's also this problem of negation, which is a significant problem as pointed out by Lochan and McDonald in their survey paper in 2016. Well, they say, unless a study can convincingly resolve the problems of negation, positive sentiment is best left untested. And this is an example of a negation, which is um, implicit, not explicit, all right? Uh, so, uh, and they also say that with uh, increasing computational power and new methods, uh, some central results uh, regarding sentiment needs to be reevaluated. So that's exactly what we do in this paper. So we introduce a state-of-the-art textual collection approach to measure sentiment. And our measure of sentiment is interpretable, it's intuitive, it's accurate. And then what we do empirically is that we address the unresolved issue regarding the positive sentiment. And then we re examine results on the negative sentiment, all right? So very briefly, our empirical findings are as follows. We find that positive sentiment is as informative as negative sentiment. Uh, it predicts abnormal return, abnormal volume, future firm fundamentals, and future firm policies. We also document market overreaction to negative sentiment and underreaction to positive sentiment. And we confirm previous studies results regarding the negative sentiment. The contribution of the paper is threefold. First is the methodology. Uh, I'll talk about the two most common methods in the current literature. But we basically introduce, this, introduce a state-of-the-art approach. Uh, it is significantly more accurate and it circumvents the need to develop word lists and using variations of the uh, word list method. 
The second contribution of the paper relates to its results regarding positive sentiment. So most of the literature has focused on negative sentiment because uh, measures of negative sentiment based on word lists are more accurate. Uh, and what we do is that we find strong empirical evidence that positive sentiment also is informative and it predicts stock price document is overreaction and underreaction. And the third contribution of the paper is uh, the methodology itself. Uh, the, so we introduced this text classification method. This can be used in context other than sentiment classification. So pretty much any aspect of the text that you're interested in, um, you can uh, you can use you use the same classification approach. But we demonstrate the benefits of using this approach in the context of sentiment class sentiment analysis. So now, how do we measure sentiment? So here's the idea: we want to read a 10k and we want to label each sentence as negative, positive, or neutral, right? Uh, and then our measure of sentiment is what percentage of sentences are positive and negative. But this is not feasible given the sheer amount of data that we have more than 200 million sentences in our 10K, uh, 10Ks. So what we do is that we use machine learning method based on neural networks to perform the exact same task that's uh, described here with a higher accuracy of 91%, which is significantly higher than the extent methods. And then we also measure negative um, Part that's related to the methodology, we compare with the two most common methods. What is the criteria to pick the best model? And then we move to the empirical analysis. So the first most common, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, et cetera. And the measure of sentiment based on word list relates, is related to the frequency of appearance of uh, positive or negative words in a document. This method is simple. It removes subjectivity once the word lists are created. But the problems are that it ignores the context. The problem of negation exists. And as a result of that, it has a very low accuracy. It was in the paper. Uh, there is a variant of this method that's called um, that uses term weighting schemes. Uh, we also talk in details in the paper why this variant uh, might seem to be more powerful, but in but it has uh, many disadvantages. And we don't see many uses of this um, variant in the literature. And the um, second uh, common method in the literature is a sentence-based method that is basically based on knife-based classification. Uh, so I, I'll skip the details of the implementation, but basic, basically what this method does is that it estimates um, the model uh, using a set of manually labeled sentences, and then it uh, tries to classify the unseen sentences and uh, label them as negative or positive or neutral. All right? So this method obviously is more intuitive because um, it does take into account the context, uh, but it's still uh, due to the underlying technologies, it has a lower accuracy than our method. And it seems like the problem of negation still exists. It still can, is not, a, it is not able to measure positive sentiment with high accuracy. Now, well, how we measure sentiment is based on deep learning um, approach. So our approach is sentence-based. So we try to label um, each sentence as a uh, class by each sentence as negative, positive, or neutral. And then we do uh, the method that we implement considers the context and the relationship between words, and it also considers the sequential nature of text, and it achieves a high, high accuracy. Now, how do we pick the best model among these three? So we have two criteria. The first one is accuracy. And what is accuracy? So we manually label a set of sentences, we classify them, and then we we give these sentences to these three models, and then we compare how they classify as compared to the manual classification and gives us the uh, measure of accuracy. And the accuracy of our approach is 91% in in-sample and 90% in out-of-sample uh, sentences. And it's significantly higher than LM, which is logarithmic McDonald words, and NBC, which is the knife-based classification method. 
And then we also um, explain in the paper why this 78% is um, more likely overestimates the true uh, accuracy of the MBC method. And we also take into account the second criteria to pick the best model among these three. And the second criteria takes into account both precision and recall. You can think of type one and type two errors. So here's an example using our data. So let's say we wanna see how accurate our uh, approach is when classifying sentences into positive category. So the precision essentially is the number of correctly classified as positive divided by the total number of cases that are classified as positive, right? Using our approach, the precision is around 80%. And recall is actually the number of correctly classified as positive divided by the number of correctly classified as positive plus the number of cases that are incorrectly not classified as positive, right? And both of these numbers are relatively high under our approach. But if you look at NBC and LM, NBC has lower precision and recall when it comes to measuring positive uh, sentiment and LM uh, does better when it comes to recall, but its precision is very low and it's consistent with what we know already from the literature that uh, LM does not a good job in measuring positive sentiment. So we report in the paper the same information for negative category and neutral and all in all it's the same so based on accuracy and precision and recall our method is superior to these other two significantly so we pick our model as a reliable way to measure sentiment and how do we actually perform this classification uh, so think of it this way we want to classify each sentence into positive negative or neutral so think of logic so the difference here is that we have a multi-way classification. And uh, so we want to give inputs to the classifier and it gives us the probability that each sentence is negative or positive or neutral. So the inputs to the model are words. Uh, so what we do is that we need to represent uh, words quantitatively. So one way is to represent each word by, by a large vector of, uh, size 45,000. But what we do in the first step is that we reduce the dimension of our data, use uh, this technique that's called word embedding. So instead of this large vector, we represent each uh, word by a vector of uh, length 200. And so this method reduces the dimension and it also uh, preserves semantic and syntactic features of words, meaning that if you look at words that are uh, that have closed meanings, they tend to have close uh, vector representation. So for instance, if you look at the word penalties, it's uh, similarity score with these words are relatively high. Basically these five words are the words that are closest to penalties in terms of their, how they are being uh, represented. All right, I guess I have five more minutes, I'm gonna speed up. So our second step in measuring sentiment is that now I, we have uh, quantified our inputs that are words, Next, we need to have a functional form to perform this classification. And our functional form is actually a recurrent neural network that takes into account the sequential nature of text. So what we do is that we manually use sentences, and then we use these to estimate the parameters of the classifier or our F function. And it reaches an accuracy of 91%. And then we use an additional 1,500 sentences to evaluate the accuracy of the classifier in out of sample. And now that we are uh, certain about the performance of our classifier, we measure negative and positive sentiment. So we, in the paper, we report the accuracy measures and um, the statistics of our measures. But now we move to the empirical uh, part of the paper. We want to answer two questions. Does the market react to the sentiment in 10 Ks and does sentiment have information beyond the quantitative information that is released by firms in 10 Ks? So 10 Ks contain lots of information on managers' views on risk performance, outlook, et cetera, and sentiment is one proxy for the qualitative information that is in the 10 Ks. So our data is from 1994 to 2017. We collect data from the SRAF, uh, textual data from SRAF, and then all other data is from CRISP and CompuStat, pretty straightforward. And then let me show you, okay, so here's our first empirical uh, test. 
So we want to see how uh, cumulative abnormal return after the filing uh, 10K is related to our measures of negative and positive sentiment. So both of our sentiment measures predict cumulative abnormal return during the filing period. So what we also do throughout the paper is that we also perform the same analysis with uh, wordless sentiment measures and naive based classification sentiment measures. And the goal is to show that if we use alternative extent measures of sentiment, then this problem of uh, low power and incorrect inferences arise. And this is consistent with what we see here. If you use wordless, uh, the results are much smaller. If you use naive based classification, you wouldn't pick up any effect. It's the same with abnormal trade volume. Throughout the paper, we also look at the changes in the sentiment because of the issue with boilerplate statements, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we also look at the cumulative abnormal return after the filing period up to one month. And what we find is that both of our sentiment measures are related to uh, these cumulative abnormal returns. Uh, so, so I'm not going to go through each and every of our empirical tests, but basically what we do is that we look at few, the predictive power of our sentiment measures regarding firm profitability in the future and firm policies in the future. And what we find is that, for instance, here, what we find is that negative sentiment and positive sentiment, when we measure with deep learning approach, predict uh, future firm profitability, such as return on assets, operating cash flow, and they also they uh, they also predict uh, future firm policies such as cash holdings and future use of leverage. And then we also uh, go into details in the paper why we list specific um, variables. Um, and I have two more minutes. All right, we do, we perform some additional analysis in the paper. We look at a trading strategy based on sentiment and we measure the uh, Fama French three factor alpha. Uh, we look at the information environment and market response to the sentiment. Uh, we also look at future firm valuation measured by Tobin skew. We also look at the future investments behavior of firms using different measures of investment behavior. And we also report all these results in the paper. So the conclusion of the paper is that, so we introduced this new uh, method to calculate, to measure sentiment that is reliable and accurate. And what we empirically find is that 10 Ks have richer information content than previously found. Uh, in particular, positive sentiment is as informative as negative sentiment when it's measured accurately. Uh, but we also find that positive and negative sentiment do not have symmetric information content. We discuss in details in the paper, the market reaction during and after the filing period and abnormal returns and how that is related to um, the literature on, um, uh, on drifts and reversals. Uh, and uh, our method can also be used in context other than sentiment classification. Note that what we do in this paper is that we classify each sentence into negative, positive, and neutral. But you, if you are interested in another aspect of a text, let's say you are interested in measuring competition or financial constraint, it's essentially a classification problem. You want to see if each sentence is related to the topic that you're interested in, and then you can also the intensity of um, the stance of that sentence regarding that topic, uh, whether it's be competition, financial constraint, et cetera, et cetera. All right, that, so that was the paper. Thank you. I'm looking forward to uh, to the uh, discussion. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Mara. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, just, uh, um, so this is, uh, um, just, um, Marilyn, congratulations for your, um, new job. I was looking at the, uh, paper, uh, glad to know you, you had the great, uh, job placement. Congratulations. And, uh, Thank you did a really good job in the presentation, explain everything very well. 
And um, yeah, I'm kind of, ha since I'm the session chair, I'm, I'm going to watch my own time. So <laughs> if I'm over time, <laughs> please let me know. I'm, uh, I'm pushing, sending you message two minutes, one minute. You can do the same thing back to me. Yeah, just in case I'm not over time. And uh, uh, what? Okay, okay. Yeah, so uh, so uh, just one more time, uh, this is Sean uh, from Georgia State. Um, originally, Baozhong was, uh, uh, Baozhong was that, that doesn't feel well. So uh, I'm going to uh, just uh, discuss the paper and, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, let, let me just start uh, the discussion. So um, Maron did a really good job summarize everything. And uh, let, let me just use one slide to summarize uh, what the paper uh, trying to achieve and uh, and also uh, just lay out the, the plan of my discussion. So the the, straight, the 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 goal of the paper is straightforward: better measurement of uh, sentiment. Um, and the, and the, uh, basically the process, uh, Maron did a very good job uh, explaining it. So first they label like uh, eight eight thousand uh, uh, sentences. They they label as uh, uh, they label the sentiment, um, and then what they do is they horse race uh, three approaches. One is using the LM dictionary to uh, uh, another one is naive Bayesian, which is a uh, um, entry level machine learning uh, method. Uh, the third one is the uh, uh, recurrent neural network, and the uh, most common used is LSTM. So what the paper actually do is uh, they use the three method to mimic the labeling process. So basically in the training sample, they label all the sentences as the good sentiment, bad sentiment, and uh, they use the three um, uh, approach to mimic the human labeling process. And uh, they use accuracy and F1 score to measure which one is more close to human labeling. And they also use the market reaction to validate which method is stronger correlated with market reaction. And the conclusion is the real network wins. So basically the neural network um, can mimic the human at a more higher accurate level and uh, has uh, uh, the both lower the type one and type two error as the Maron explained. So this is what the, the paper actually uh, trying to do. Um, and uh, uh, I want to congratulation on the paper. It's a first coming on the review of uh, uh, asset, asset pricing studies already. And um, so you also uh, make me think, how should I discuss the paper? Uh, things is uh, uh, already forthcoming and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, well, well established. So I, I, I pondered a while and uh, what I'm going to do is instead of discuss the paper, I, I want to discuss the common challenge that we are facing uh, when we write this type of machine learning papers. I think it may fit the, the conference theme well since most of papers are related to the machine learning and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, this type of research. So I, I'm, I'm going to share the common challenges we're facing uh, not, not this paper is facing, I mean, in general, what we are facing to promote this type of new research. And another thing is I want to uh, just uh, suggest some interpretation because uh, uh, one important thing is interpreted interpret technology. So maybe the why, why the RN uh, wins LM, maybe the reason is different from the why the RN wins the naive base. So, so um, maybe I will just uh, uh, talk a little bit about the interpretation. And the third one is, I suggest some potential extension for the study since the paper is done. So uh, uh, I can summarize uh, what, what we have done in the literature and, uh, and the suggested potential extension for the authors. So, so this, is a, um, this is a very simple graph. I, I want to summarize what the paper, including this type of research. So this type of research is called the information, information retrieval. So basically the idea here is there's a lot of firm information they are in the unstructured form. For example, textual, picture, voice, word, uh, video. Uh, uh, like in, in decades ago, we are not able to extract useful information from unstructured data because uh, um, because uh, um, I have 15 minutes left, right? Oh, okay, yeah. So, um, so, uh, so decades ago, we don't have the tools to actually extract um, unstructured data from the form disclosure. But now you can look at the the author's paper. They can they can get information from 10K pictures and everything. 
it, it just, we have to give credit to two things. One is the machine learning techniques we have. Another is one's computing power. So, um, and, uh, and uh, so what's the common challenge we actually have? What we have is the first one is we need to justify why the technology can do the job. And uh, this is the challenge um, uh, I think I'm facing and uh, a lot of papers are facing. So, um, so sometimes I, I, I sometimes I write a, a paper using emerging technology. Uh, the, some common comments I got is, uh, well, why this is a business paper? Why is not a computer science paper? So, uh, so what I over time what I learned is uh, in a paper how how we can justify this is the right question to ask and this is the quite uh, right technology to answer the right question. So that's the first uh, challenge I I have facing. Uh, uh, in, in, in developing this new new area. The second one is what's the economic story? Like the paper we discussed here, they explain the market reaction, the future performance, but they, there must be something uh, business scholars have to learn from, from the study instead of knowing the methodology and the machine learning. So the economic story actually uh, addressed the earlier concern I have, like why this is a business paper is not a computer science paper. So the economic story, I think um, sometimes we tend to, uh, um, we tend to uh, 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 downgrade that, but I, I just want to emphasize it's very important to talk about economic story uh, when we uh, uh, when we when we uh, uh, develop this type of research, the third one is we have to make the technology understandable to people who don't have computer science background. So all the summaries, if any of you guys are interested, so we are we are hosting the um, we are hosting we have been hosting the uh, fintech conference with RFS. The summarize the three points is actually from the three hundred machine learning paper submission. If you guys are uh, uh, interested, you can go to the website. Uh, Baozhong, this is Baozhong, uh, so I, I, I had a chance to post Baozhong here. This is Baozhong. Baozhong summarized all the submission in different categories. So if you're interested, you can go to the website to see more discussion about the challenges and the type of machine learning research we have received. So um, I just do a very, very quick um, um, summary of the technology and going back to the, the paper. So we have a supervised learning. We have uh, unsupervised learning, we have self-supervised learning, we have transfer learning, we have ensemble learning. This paper falls well on the supervised learning because they are labeling the sentiment and trying to mimic the human judgment. And uh, I would say they also belong to the ensemble learning because they use a uh, virtual vector as the first uh, input for their uh, neural network. So it falls well for uh, under the category of supervised learning and the ensemble learning. And, uh, and uh, uh, so this is something uh, uh, actually, uh, this is the common machine learning techniques we are using right now. And uh, the paper falls in the two categories. So uh, the interpretation, so why interpretation I would, uh, uh, maybe the, the, the authors can uh, think about extension is, the reason why the RNN is better than LM is because the labeling process is by author's labor. So what if the labeling, what, what if, what if the benchmark is not an uh, author's labors? What if the benchmark is LM labors? I would think LM dictionary will be close to high accuracy and high F1 scores. So the one, one, uh, one problem with supervised learning here is because the benchmark is against the human labeling uh, process. So depends on which label we use, the accuracy will be different. In this case, uh, the, 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 the training is based on the author's labors. So uh, um, it's, it's uh, intuitive to get the high accuracy, but if they actually use the LM labors, the story might be different. I'm not saying the authors are doing the wrong thing. What I'm saying is uh, the authors can think about other in interesting interpretations, it can be an interesting extension on the study. And also the, the authors find a strong market reaction results. That's also help the, the paper. So this is uh, um, uh, one, one interpretation of the, uh, the authors can think about. And uh, the, the last, uh, I just want to, uh, um, uh, I think I have one minute left. So I just want to say that uh, what we have observed, uh, what potential extension for the authors is, the authors has done good job on the information retrieval, retrieval information for investors. They are the type of uh, machine learning, uh, Maron, I, I found his uh, uh, background is pretty solid. 
uh, using this new network. And uh, um, you can, we can see that in the conference, we have been using machine learning to forecast the firm outcome. And also some studies, we don't need any machine learning techniques. We can just use, uh, we can ex examine in the market the consequence of machine learning regulations or data analytics, uh, change in data analytics for industries. So, so these are the other type of uh, directions of research uh, we can actually extend to. So uh, uh, again, more information you guys can see from the uh, from the uh, the fintech conference I was uh, talk about earlier. Uh, we we summarize all the type of researches and you guys can see. So um, I, again, I just want to thank you for the organizers. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, I know this is pandemics. Hopefully next time we'll get together in Miami. I think uh, it's a it's a better format. Uh, if I if I if I'm right, yeah. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sean, for running things. And thank you to all the presenters for wonderful papers. So we've got a 15 minute break now.